Welcome to the Missionary Disciple Podcast by Catholic Christian Outreach. As we're between seasons this summer, we'll be sharing recordings from our Rise Up Conference in Toronto last December. This includes both keynote and workshop talks featuring a variety of fantastic speakers. We hope you enjoy them. Before we begin, let's open in prayer because um, no matter how much um, information I could like barf onto this room, it's only really what the Holy Spirit's going to do and you're being captured by the Holy Spirit that's going to make any of this make any sense. So let's give him room right now. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, we give you permission. Holy Spirit, I give you this workshop. Pray for the intercession of St. Ignatius of Loyola, whose genius is what I am attempting to uh, summarize and communicate to our friends. St. Ignatius, that you would pray for us as I share. And let each of the words and the, the, the phrases that are the most pertinent, that they would stick, that they would be tattooed on the heart, and that they would be guideposts for these dear young people as they seek to do your will. Give them ears to listen and give me the words to speak. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. So, now maybe some of you came here to learn about discerning God's will, yeah? Maybe some of you came here to understand discernment of spirits. Anybody? Okay, and guess what, they're... They're not the same thing, but they are. What? Anyway, they're related, but they're not the same thing. So the first thing about giving any kind of a talk on discerning God's will in an Ignatian perspective is it doesn't make any sense unless you know discernment of spirits. And that kind of sounds freaky, but it really is not. So discernment of spirits is basically like the cartoon where there's like a devil on one shoulder and an angel with a halo on the other shoulder and they're prompting you to do different things. And one is like awesome for you and the right thing and the other is terrible for you and will lead to your death and destruction. That's what St. Ignatius is actually talking about. That all of the thoughts in your head are not just, well, they're my thoughts. Some of the thoughts in your head are prompted by the good spirit and some of them are prompted by the enemy of your soul. And you need to be able to discern whose voice am I hearing? And the enemy can be heard as Father, uh, sorry, Bishop Scott said, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Meaning it can be just things that are in worldly society that are influencing your thoughts and creating a, a, a perspective or a thought or an opinion. It can be actual temptation that's outright your flesh wanting to desire something in a really like disordered way. Or it could actually be the enemy interjecting in a very specific and clear way, in kind of a creepy way, right? So those things are are happening in our minds. And sometimes the enemy isn't actually creepy. He's just sneaky. And he twists things and he messes around and he says things that sound like they're truth, but if you Hold off for a second. You examine it. Would the Lord say this? And how is this making me feel right now? What is it prompting in me? This is discernment of spirits. So discernment right now. Hold that. Just hold that thought. Discernment, the topic discernment right now. For the last, I'd say, 20 or 30 years is kind of a Catholic buzzword. As is having a spiritual director, by the way. I'm a spiritual director. Just to say, sometimes I find that there's a kind of a weird security in having a spiritual director, which means I don't really pray, but I have a spiritual director, so I'm good. And your spiritual director is not your little amulet in your pocket that makes your spiritual life legit. Spiritual director is actually more like a spiritual accompanier. So please don't use your spiritual director that way because they are just supposed to help you discern what you're discerning in your prayer. Just a little side note. Um, But Father Bob Bedard is the founder of the Companions of the Cross, which is the order that Bishop Scott belongs to, okay? And 
Father Bob said, and this was like 30 years ago, he said, um, well, what does he say? Oh, he said, um, since discernment has become fashionable, no one has made a decision ever since. I'm discerning, right? So it's a very spiritual word, but do you really know what you're saying and what you're doing with it? It also isn't a magic eight ball. I was looking at the office. Anybody have a magic eight ball? Of course, they're all spiritual people. They do not. But, you know, like, okay, what is God saying? And, you know, trying to just get a quick read on what's going on. And what we really mean when we say I'm discerning or I want to do discernment is we actually, in our hearts, in our shallowness, we want a really fast, clear, most awesome for me answer. Okay? And I will discern until I get the fast, clear, most awesome for me answer. So I'm going to like blow that to smithereens and we're going to look at what discernment really is. And it is actually awesome and reliable. So, excuse me, I need water. Okay, so here's the short notes. If you fall asleep after this, you'll be okay. Okay, I'm going to give you my best things first and we're going to unpack them. First thing you want to write down is Father Timothy Gallagher. He's the best. I'm totally fangirling Father Gallagher. He came to Rise Up last year. I had supper with him. Can you believe that? I got to ask him all the questions to my heart. Just me and him. Well, there's other people, but I was across from him, so I got all his attention, <laughs> and I totally took it all. He's awesome. Father Gallagher's books on discernment of spirits, discerning God's will. He's got tons. Also, write this down, discerninghearts.com discerninghearts.com has tons of podcasts but there's a channel of podcasts that are just timothy gallagher and he literally does all of his books on podcast and every podcast relates to a chapter of the book almost perfectly and when you hear his voice you will hear a gentle holy man and he totally is that's why i like him so much okay so that's your like go-to resources to learn more. Can't recommend it enough. And write these words down. Peace, courage, clarity. This will take you very far in life. On discernment of God's will. Peace, courage, clarity. Another word to write down is detachment. Sounds painful. Also called holy indifference. We're going to talk about it. And the last thing I want you to write down is Latin, kind of like Pro Ecclesiae Pontifice. But this is ad maiorum dei gloriam. So you may be seen on Julius's bag. Some of the Toronto kids have bags with this motto. Ad as in AD. Majorum it's majorum, so major, M-A-J-O-R-E-M, Dei, being God, D-E-I, put it in the capital, please, and Gloriam, so Gloria with an M. Now you can go to sleep. For those that have the energy... What I'm going to spend most of my time talking about this morning is the prerequisites for discerning God's will. This summer, our family redid our backyard, which was a big deal because we really love our backyard. So we've made the decision to do it, and I'm telling you, the, the process was um, overwhelming and painful because our backyard for all of, from the fall until May, was a big mud pit of junk. It was just disaster everywhere. And we had to break everything, take it away, rip everything out, dig, dig, dig. And these dudes came in with packers and they put in like, I don't know, stuff. And then they pack, 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 pack. And then they leave and they come back with another pile of stuff and pack, pack, pack. And this process went on for like two weeks. And all I saw in my backyard was mud and chaos. And I thought, what have we done to our backyard? But they came back and they put another layer of stuff and pack, 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 pack. 
And I thought, we will never get this done before Caleb's wedding. This is never going to end. And then one day, on June 1st, they put all the bricks and it was done. It was done. And I say that because the packing and the digging and the removing and the preparing of the land is important to lay the proper bricks so that we could have parties at my house. Because if we didn't lay the foundation right, things would get messed up and we wouldn't have a long-term patio for our family. This is what you're doing with these essentials for discernment. Because if you don't pack the things, actually your discernment will be rocky and things will, things will be affected. You'll still have a backyard. You'll still have a plan. But will it be the best and long and enduring and confident? I don't think so. So here's the packing down that needs to happen. So the first is an active prayer life. I know, of course. Yeah, but really. Because I'm a spiritual director, so I know that actually probably two-thirds of you are not praying very well. Of course, because that's part of the Christian journey. How can you know what the Lord is saying to you if you only go and talk to him when it's Christmas and you need something from Santa? How do you know it's Santa's voice? You need to have a, an active discernment of spirits kind of prayer life where you are listening for the Lord's voice and discerning the Lord doesn't talk to me that way. That's the enemy trying to fool me or trick me or lie to me. And that this kind of lifestyle of knowing the Lord's promptings and movings in your life, that you're constantly praying, will help you when you're discerning. Because I know how the Lord has been working in my life. I know how he talks to me. He's been giving me this scripture for quite a while. He has been showing me these things for quite a while. And now it's actually all clicking in. But as young people, we're very busy. And I know what it was like when I was in university. And I prayed very hard when I had to make a decision about changing my faculty or about a boyfriend or about my summer job or whatever. Then I got very active in my prayer. And I'm embarrassed to say it because it's just kind of like using God. So then I got serious and desperate. And I'm like, where are you? I'm listening. I'm trying to find you, right? Because I didn't know his voice. I hadn't been walking with it well. I was praying, but it wasn't praying well. So discernment of spirits. Um, gosh, I'm just going to say a little bit about it. Um, in a nutshell, you can write this down. The enemy speaks to us, it seems, in D words. Like just throw out a bunch of D words, like despair, disturb, discourage, deceive. You guys think of any other good D words that work here? What? Division. Division. Yeah. Delusion. <laughs> Don't. Wow. You guys are awesome. I never thought of those. That's cool. Yeah. Um, St. Ignatius says, write this one down too. First week rules for discernment of spirits. So it's basically his first set of rules for how to discern it. And it's for the spiritual exercises. But rule two and rule four are particularly um, great. And I, I, I re reference them often in my own prayer life and with the people I direct spiritually. Because he outlines what it is to be guided by the enemy and what it is when the, the, the Lord is leading you. And the Lord leads through peace, courage, and clarity. Those aren't Ignatius's words. Those are actually Bishop Scott's words who taught me. And the enemy will try to disturb and discourage and say don't and deceive and divide and disturb disrupt. He does things in the, Ignatius says, the movements of the heart, the motions of the heart. What's happening inside of your heart when you're thinking about something or you have an encounter? And what does it do in you? Does it create a disturbance of your spirit? Or does it lift you to some sort of faith, hope, or charity? Does it create some sort of a peace and courage and clarity. These are your telltales of what's going on. 
And it's amazing how we don't recognize what's going on in our own life. That's why you do need a spiritual director or close friends that can say, well, how's this making you feel in your heart, in your spirit? And you're like, ah, oh, I'm freaking out actually. Freaking out's not necessarily a bad thing because the Lord might be trying to get your attention. But is the freak out going to lead you to moving towards God or move you away from God? So the, the discernment of spirits, the enemy wants you to be discouraged in going towards God and his will. That's his complete plan. He actually wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He hates you. But Christ, the good spirit, the Holy Spirit, wants you to go on from good to better. So when you're experiencing emotion in your heart, is this feeling like, I probably shouldn't go to Rise Up, I should stay home with my family? Is that a thought that is leading you to good to better or to keep you away from God? And I'm not saying the right answer is, of course, go to Rise Up. I'm not. Because maybe the Lord actually wants you to stay with your family because something's about to break in the family dynamic and you need to evangelize your sister. He might very well be saying it. And you're like, I just feel like I shouldn't go to rise up. And I feel peace and courage and clarity. That's what I have to do. Even though I'd rather be with my friends jumping up and down, but you're not allowed to jump up and down at the rise up dance. What are we going to do? How can, how can we have a dance without jumping? I don't even know. Are we in a different ballroom? I sure hope we're on a different level. Because No. Okay, but tip, as an old lady that's had a lot of babies, you just use your knees, you just do this. I fake it all the time. <laughs> so, we'll all do deep knee bends. Okay, so peace, courage, and clarity is really, really helpful. Because peace, courage, and clarity to go towards the Lord, to go from good to better in his service, or a disturbance of soul that wants to lead you away. And if you can't see it clearly for yourself, maybe exercise it with one of your friends first. So it's easier to see into someone else's life than your own. Just try that. As someone's sharing something to you, just say like, do I see here, this is what a spiritual director would do, do I see this person has peace, courage, clarity, and is moving towards greater things for the Lord? Or do I see false reasons that are disturbing them to keep them from growing closer to the Lord? Okay. I love the fact that you're nodding. That tells me you're understanding and you're awake. That's all really awesome. So this is what the kind of prayer life you should be having. Also with this kind of a prayer life, Ignatian thing is examine. So it's like French, examen. So it's exam with an E-N. So the examine for Ignatius is like 10 minutes at the end of your day to review what's happened. And I think women do this naturally because we're always processing stuff. But for guys, I don't think you guys do think when you go to bed. My husband doesn't. Um, but girls are always like, what did that mean? Why did they say that? Like, what is it? So awesome. That's what we're talking about. So you're overviewing the day and we want to have two attitudes. One of, it's an examine. Oh, let me add this. Examine of consciousness. Ooh, not conscience, but consciousness. So it's an awareness examine. So I'm looking over my day, and it's kind of like corks are popping up out of the day. Things that stand out. Oh, man, I really blew it with this. Oh, I regret that. If I could do that all over again. Or that was really awesome. Like you totally gave me the words to say to that person. And we bumped into each other in the hallway. That was really crazy. Like, thank you, Holy Spirit. So there's an awareness of when the Lord was present or strengthening you or inspiring you or when you regret things that you did or didn't do. But also there can be like the most weird thing that's just in your head from the day, like a random exchange, like the lady at the Tim Hortons that Scratch up. Okay, the lady at Starbucks, okay? I don't go to Tim's. Um, and the way that you interact with her, the way you looked at her, there's something that just it stands out at the end of the day. So then what do you do with that? You ask the Lord, Lord, what's with that? Why is this woman coming to mind? And you ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten you. And it might be that she reminds you of something and the Lord wants you to go into it. It could be 
triggering something that the Lord wants to heal. Or it could be that the Lord is just like, I just want you to pray for that lady. Okay, cool. I will. Thank you for that. Thank you for that encounter. Thank you for the awareness to see that encounter. I'm going to pray for that lady. Lord bless her. So that's the examine. So it helps you too. And if you want extra, extra, extra brownie points, journal your examine. This will help you if you're discerning something. So journaling is really important. Because we'll get to it later, but the writing things down will help you to look back and see how has the Holy Spirit been working in my life. Okay. Now, we've just laid some gravel. What? We haven't done anything yet. The yard's still a mess. Yes. Okay. Second thing we're going to do. Detachment and holy indifference is big time important for discernment. So this means in the most healthy way possible, I am detached and indifferent to anything other than God's will. And write this down. Lord, I want what you want. Lord, I want what you want. Help me to see it. I want what you want. I will surrender to you my fears and I will surrender to you my preferences and my desires and I lay them all to you and take them all and fix them and redeem them and squish them together and show me what it is that you want for me for your kingdom. And this holy indifference, this detachment is so important that you are like ready to move at the slightest breath of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you just show me and I will tip that way. To quote Father Bob Bedard again, he says, Lord, the answer is yes before you even ask. That's crazy abandonment. That's scary abandonment, actually. But this is the fight in the heart. And this is where actually most people's discernment of God's will completely gets wrecked. Because most people do not fight for detachment. Most people, honestly, come to a spiritual director to prove their case for why God is telling them to do the thing they would prefer. And they want the spiritual director, that sounds good, yeah. Okay, my spiritual director said it's okay. But actually, they're not detached. They actually are trying to put the odds in their own favor. But that is, sure, do that. I mean, God's not going to, like, smite you. But if you actually want to discern God's will then you need to fight every day for detachment. And I'm going to give you something before you leave that unpacks every day to do an examine of the prerequisites for discerning God's will. Because you're going to fight back and forth. You're going to be like, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go do this thing. And then you're like, oh, okay, no, Lord, I give you, I give it all to you. I'm going to put it back on the table. You, I want you, I want what you want. I choose it again today. And you just have to do it every day. As soon as you notice it happening, push it back. Nope, I want what you want more than what I want. I want you to conform my wants. I want to be what you want. So it's really a battle. So it's not just, yep, yeah, sure, detachment. No, like you're going to fight through this the entire discernment process. And if you're not, you're a saint or you're not doing it right. I hope you're a saint. That'd be nice. Third point for your gravel, another layer of gravel, is um, seeking godly counsel. So that could be your spiritual director. But someone who you know has a gift of wisdom. And also preferably someone who knows you pretty well. And who also loves the Lord deeply. Because if you don't kind of have all three, you will get... Um, different messages. So some people go like, yeah, well, I talked to my mom. Okay, your mom knows you well and your mom has wisdom. And that's not too bad, but actually your mom doesn't go to church. So that's a certain amount of wisdom you can gain, but it's not the fullness. But your aunt, who's a nun, who's awesome, loves the Lord, is alive in the spirit and has a gift of wisdom. Now there's a little treasure you're going to want to like, auntie, sister, blah, blah, blah. You know, I need, like, this is what I'm feeling. 
Now, this godly counsel is not a guru or a fortune teller. This person is to listen to what you have been sensing and how you've been sensing the Holy Spirit directing you, who should be able to say to you, this sounds sound. It sounds sound. It seems to resonate with who you are. And I think the Lord is speaking to you. And I feel like this is going well. Let's keep praying. So they don't have a magic wand and all knowledge, but they can help you say like, this does, this sounds off. Or as a spiritual director, I'll say like, I hear you trying to convince me actually, but I don't hear you trying to show me. And I think you need to pray more. So, but you do need to have that other person to bounce it off of. And it could be like more than one. Like it could be your, your brothers or sisters in the Lord. It could be this older role model and it could be a spiritual director. It could be a priest. And if you actually have like well-chosen people and if those four people all say like, sounds really solid. What does that give you? Confidence. It gives you confidence. Like, yeah, like I've, I've checked my discernment against a few like litmus tests and I don't think I'm making a big mistake to try this. Okay. So you want to have that counsel in the process. Okay. Fourth point is that the ad majorum day gloriam, AMDG for short. This is also where most people don't, um, don't do this in discerning God's will. This principle means for the greater glory of God, for the greater glory of God. We usually discern God's will for the greater glory of Angel, for my greater good, for the best, awesomest plan for me is what I would like to discern. But I am challenging you, if you want to discern God's will, according to St. Ignatius, you will discern only what is for the greater glory of God. What does he need me to do like Card- St. Cardinal Henry Newman? What am I supposed to do in this world that no one else can do? And it's not a trick question. You're all supposed to be priests and nuns. No, because the body of Christ is varied and there are all kinds of needs and there are souls and sheep that are lost all over this world. So you working at a grocery store or being a bishop is going to put you in contact with people who desperately need to know the good news. So it's not a trick question. Where does the Lord need you and is calling you for his greater glory? And sometimes the obvious actually does tell you the obvious answer. I should be, um, be a priest or I should just, um, I don't know, do something really boring. Like it's just, it's, it's so bland and it's really obvious that this would be for God's greater glory. Sometimes that actually is the right answer, but Ignatius wants to filter all of these things and say like, what does God need me to do for his greater glory? And what would give him the greatest glory? And if it is the, the not obvious answer, he will give you supreme clarity on actually work at the grocery store and it'll be super clear. But a lot of the time, he's actually just asking you in normal terms, how can you live your life to give me the greatest impact? What will maximize your time on earth? And I just keep quoting the companions, but they're awesome. Bishop Scott's homily was just awesome. Like in 10 years from now, in 100 years from now, what will you remember about your life? And what will people remember about your life? And are you going to live for your life, are you going to live for eternity? For what lasts for eternity? How will your life count now for what matters for all of time, for the alpha and the omega, and for all of those souls that desperately needed to hear what you have to offer? And this sort of conviction totally changed my life as a university student. I was like, wow, like I was smart. I could, could have done anything. I could have like I, I could have gone to any faculty I wanted, but when I heard those kinds of challenges, like I, I want to reach the world for Christ, for souls forever. Like that's what I want to live my life for. 
And that's why I work with university students, because I think you're the most strategic place to put my energy because you're awesome and capable and energetic and smart. And you're going to just go all over the earth and do amazing things. So that's why I'm here because I think this is what the Lord has called me to do. But also I see for the greater glory of God, I'm going to impact more by working with you than if I was a teacher with 30 kids every year. And not that one's better than the other, but I could see the strategy behind it that I could impact more here than I could over there when I was a teacher. So I ended up choosing teaching. And I totally impacted my class. 29 of them out of 30 put Christ at the center of their life when I was teaching them. But the Lord had a greater glory of God intended for me in my life. And that's how I was able to discern it because I was thinking eternity What's the biggest bang for my buck? Because I'm not that great. I can do a lot here. And also university is just awesome, right? Except essays. Our last layer of crushed gravel is constant vigilance. So if you are discerning God's will... All of these things are part of that consciousness examine. Am I seeking the Lord in prayer through scripture, through in seeking the discernment of spirits, through a profound friendship and communication with Jesus Christ, in communion with the Father and Holy Spirit, with the communion of saints, sacraments, communion, all the stuff. Do I have an active prayer life? Am I vigilant in my detachment? Am I vigilant in seeking the thing that will bring God the greatest glory with my life for eternity? And am I vigilant in seeking out the right counsel? Okay. So that's laying the gravel. Okay. I'm going to take a pause for a few questions right now because I haven't even started talking about discerning God's will yet. (laughs) So we're going to lay bricks really soon. Are there any questions about these prerequisites? So if you're discerning the spirits and you're like, this isn't the Lord, this is the enemy. What you're supposed to do, Ignatius says, reject, reject. So you can write this down to aware, understanding, and response, maybe is a good word to put. So first of all, you have to be aware that something is happening because it's your own thoughts and you're kind of like lost and like, "Ah, I feel kind of yucky or, oh, you know, like something's going on inside of you and you're not, you're just living your life and you're just dealing. But if you're aware, like, whoa, something's going on inside of me. Okay. First of all, you're aware. I'm feeling something. (coughs) Second step is understanding. Where is the source of this thought? Is this the Lord's voice? Is this the enemy's voice? You go to rules two and four and you look at it again. You're thinking about it. And then you're like, this is, this is the enemy's voice. Your response, if it's of the Lord, you are to receive it. It's from the enemy. You are to reject it. It's pretty simple. Receive or reject. But there's a a stance of your heart and your mind where you have to engage yourself in prayer, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and say, that is a lie. That's the enemy. And if you can, a great thing to do is to find the counter lie. What's the truth? I'm not a loser. Actually, the Lord has shown me his love in so many ways, and I'm good at school. I'm a good person. Like, Where is this coming from? That's a lie. The Lord has told me this. These are my favorite scriptures. This worship song totally speaks to me. I'm going to reject it through actively engaging my mind in the right thing. And that, another Latin word for you is a Jerry Contra. Thanks for bringing that up. That's awesome. A-G-E-R-E. Contra, like contraband, drugs, Contra. A jerry contra means act against. Act against. Someone's texting me. It means 
Ignatius is saying do diametrically the opposite to punch Satan in the face. So if he's saying you're a loser, you say, I'm a winner. And you have to actually, that's why finding the truth behind the lie is really important because he's trying to convince you of something that must be really important for you to know right now. Actually, the Lord allowing the enemy to mess with you is a gift because it's always, he's letting it happen because a big fat grace is right behind it. The opposite is super true. And he wants to just push it into you. And he's making you push back to make it bigger. I don't know why, but that's what he does. So it's kind of a rocky move. Like you're just going to like do the cross. You're going to like, no, actually, boom. Dan Oberg's in the back. He knows all the things I tell him. It's like, no. Like we've had a lot of rocky conversations. But you have to like look at the lie, pick a truth. Actually, right now in Paris, I'm just making this up. We're going to do a workshop thing. <laughs> Think of a typical lie you would hear like in like your spiritual life and let a friend just come up with the truth or just discuss it together. A lie and a truth. Like um, the, and how to punch back. Like what would be the opposite thing to do if the enemy is bugging you about your blah, blah, blah. Okay. Right now. Think and then do. Okay, all you cool kids. Does anybody have a particularly, like, you're proud of, like, we came up with a good one? Uh, punch in the face? A Jerry Contra? Okay, come to the mic. I can see you're a soft, sweetie. Come. Soft voice. I would not say that about you. <laughs> Tough guy. Okay. Um, wow. <laughs> um, it would be, you're not strong enough. And I would take the, like, one of the scriptures. I can do all, th all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Very good. Very good. Scripture is awesome because if you read Ephesians 6 with the armor... Right? There's only one offensive piece to that armor, and that's the sword, which Paul says is the word of God. So if you have scriptures that like your scripture, put that on your mirror, do something in Canva and make a nice thing and frame it, right? <laughs> totally. Because you need to be reminded and everybody be like, nice artwork. And you're like, it's mine. Like, you know the story, <laughs> right? That's my Jerry Contra. Yeah, it's so good. Um, the Jerry Contra also requires like action sometimes. So like, especially like, um, I don't need to pray this morning or I got to like do things. Like the enemy will want you to not pray. That's like number one. You don't have to pray or you prayed yesterday or you can pray later. And this is where he takes us out because he wants to stop you from going from good to greater in the service of the Lord. So where's he going to hit? Relationship. So my recommendation is, so Jerry Contra is actually, no, I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray one minute longer because you're just being a jerk about it. <laughs> I filtered my words, <laughs> but you, or I can't pray. I'm distracted. Then get up out of bed and go sit in the living room with a cup of coffee and pray and show the enemy. You are not going to be messed around with. These are not my words. These are the words of Bishop Scott McCaig. Okay. So do not let him, and if you have to fight him your whole prayer time, moving around the house and trying to sit and have your prayer time, you've actually defeated him. Because it's not how well you pray. It's not how good you do it. It's the fact that you are fighting for it and you're ripping him off while you're doing it. And it's awesome. So watch him squirm. Let him keep coming at you. I'll just move to another spot because I'm going to pray here. Just don't give in. So you got to be tough. Got to fight. Okay, so now let's start talking about discernment of God's will. Remember we talked about a fire hose? You guys just got a good dose. Now, when you're making a decision in Ignatian discernment, here's the, the overarching, like, shtick of how it's going to work. He has three particular modes of discernment that we will unpack, one, two, and three. Then there's a period of praying and evaluating and confirming the decision, the tentative decision. Um, sorry, you make a tentative decision and then you do the seeking and confirming it. So that's, that's the arch that you're going to do. And I'm going to walk through the three ways of discerning. Um, Ignatius calls them three times. The first time, 
and he also calls it, some people translate it as modes. Modes makes way more sense in the English language. So the first mode of discernment is what we all want. And it's an undeniable act of God with an angel up before us with a scroll delivering it and it fills your heart with joy and it's amazing. It's an annunciation experience. There's no doubting it. It's so clear. It's so beautiful. It fills you with peace, courage, and clarity immediately. You know it's the Lord. Everybody who talks to you knows that you know that it's the Lord. Like it's just, it's the best. Okay? So that can happen and it does happen, but it's not actually like the normal, but it can happen. Okay. So we want to be open to that. If that happens, you actually don't need to discern anymore. The Lord has made it abundantly clear. You're good to go, go and be awesome and treasure it. The reason why this discernment stuff, like the building and the working it is so like, um, I don't know, intense here, the way I'm describing it. It's because when the storms come and when you're not having fun anymore and when you're shipwrecked and starving and put in prison, you know that you know the Lord called me to this. You're not like, what what am I doing here? This was wrong. I should go back. That's what the Israelites did, the whole history of salvation and in the Old Testament. But Paul did all the things I'm talking about. Read 2 Corinthians 4. The guy was, his life was a disaster. It's crazy. Like, don't you think the greatest missionary of all Christendom should have had it like easy to just get her done? But no, the guy's in prison and shipwrecked and poisoned and like just, it's all like ridiculous. So how does he know that he's not gonna like flinch? Because he got knocked off a horse. And Christ himself appeared to him. He was blind and a guy healed him. And like, because the thing happened, like there's, there's no denying what happened to Paul. Like he's not turning around. I encountered the Lord. I know what I am. I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. So awesome, right? And you're like, sure, that ain't going to happen. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. Second way. Second mode is through discernment of spirits. That's why I talked about it so much. Discernment of spirits. Now, when you're in a place of actually discerning, so let's say you come to rise up and now you're thinking, wow, I think the Lord's calling me to go on net or wow, like that order is real. Like those nuns are really adorable or like those priests are really like courageous or, um, staff, CISO staff sounds really fun. Or like I should get my master's and get a PhD and be a professor in the world. Like whatever the things are that are attracting you right now, you're like, I need to discern. Okay. So you can do it later. No, let's do it now. Let's do it now. So take a period of time where you're going to invest in the discernment. So what most people do, what I did when I was your age, is I kind of pray about it for four months until the deadline got close and I'd freak out and pray a lot and then like pick what was moving in my heart at that moment. Okay. That's just not discernment. That's just, I don't know, making a decision. But discernment is you're going to apply yourself. So let's say you, something has happened here at Rise Up. So you're like, okay, you know what? For the month of January, I'm going to buckle down and I'm going to seriously discern for a month. I'm going to seriously apply myself to the process. So I'm going to make sure I'm having a one hour prayer time every day or a half hour. But it's going to be consistent, daily, like scheduled time slots. You're not messing around with God. You wouldn't do that to a friend, right? going to be tricking them when you're going to appear at Starbucks. You just, when you say you're at Starbucks, you're at Starbucks. And you're going to be doing discernment of spirits in that prayer time. But more importantly, you're going to have your prayer time rooted in scripture. Rooted in scripture. And the easiest way to do that is the readings of the day. That's the easiest thing to do. And it's amazing how the Lord just puts scriptures for the day that you're like, what as if this is like today? I can't believe it. Happens a lot especially the Gospels. Father Gallagher really emphasizes this in discernment. So we need to go to the Gospels, even ones that aren't in the daily readings, to look at how Jesus was calling the disciples. 
how he interacted with them and how the disciples responded back to him and put yourself in the scene. Play it over and now like, if I was in this scene, what character would I be or where would I be in this scene? And allow, this is Ignatius. I'm not making this stuff up. This is Ignatius. Engaging your imagination with the Holy Spirit of where would I be in this scene? Am I the role of Peter? Am I a mousy little person on the shore watching them? And what does it mean? Don't get too worried about like, I wasn't the starring role. Like, what does it mean that he put me in this Holy Spirit imaginative prayer as Peter? What does it mean that I'm the mousy person on the shore? Talk to Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit about it. What are you showing me in this experience? Ponder it. Let him show you. And he might say, you're Peter because you're totally a leader and you're trying to deny it. Or you might say, you're the mousy person on the shore because I want you to come in close. And you're just like lingering over there. Like, what are you doing? All the actions over here. You're like, oh my gosh, totally. Right? So just let the imaginative prayer play out and then ponder it. Talk to the Lord about it. Journal it. Journal it. And then say, okay, Lord, in regards to the question, should I go on net? Now think about going on net right now. Lord, do you want me to go on net? Lord, I want what you want. You think about the passage and you're like, wow, they had nets on the boat. (laughs) That's crazy. Are you serious? Okay, you're like, okay, that's kind of crazy. Write it down in your journal. Hold that thought. We're not going to jump. I'm joining net. Okay, hold the thought. Okay, Lord. That's cool. If that's from you, you keep confirming it. I'm just going to keep living my day. Throughout the day, other things happen. And maybe, weird, you bump into, you're at a parish and there's a net post right on the door. And like, okay, what is happening? Like there's net signs everywhere. So you, at the exam and at the end of the day, you're like, super weird. I went to go do my adoration at St. Peter and Paul and there was a net poster on the door. Just noting it. Okay. Next morning you go to prayer. Go to prayer and say, Lord, even though I'm kind of excited that you're showing me all these net signs, Lord, I give it back to you. I want what you want. Show me what you want. I want to follow you. Lead me into your scriptures. And just go into scriptures with this blank slate again. Enter it. Then go into prayer. And when you have, don't go into like, what should I do when you're actually in desolation? Desolation doesn't mean like I'm in a dark night of the soul. It just means I'm not, I'm feeling freaking out. I'm in, in a bad space. You need to seek stability with the Lord in your prayer time. Because the Lord will not lead you through fear and freak out and disturbance. He does not lead that way. He leads through, what do you think? Peace, courage, and clarity. So it doesn't mean the peaceful, easy thing. There's peace and courage to do the crazy. I know this is nuts, but I just feel peace and courage to do this. I should be freaking out. And I'm kind of freaking out, but mostly I feel like this is, he's, he's getting me to do it. So it doesn't mean there's an absence of freak out, but the overarching sense is in my spirit, there's peace and courage. And I just know it's right. So if you're not in that place in your prayer time, you're reading the scriptures and you're like freaking out and you're like, you're disturbed and you're whatever, a Jerry Contra, get up, move, go pray somewhere else, go to your scriptures, fight for the Lord, praise him. It's really important in your worship. I love the songs we've been singing. Like there's more reasons to praise than to fear. The enemy hates a lot of things. Okay. He hates scripture, hates the gospels. He hates Jesus. He hates the Eucharist. He hates Our Lady, and he hates praises. You know, the enemy used to appear to Padre Pio as an angel of light, telling him beautiful words. And Padre Pio wasn't sure what was what. So he'd always tell whatever vision he had that came to him. He'd say, say the name of Jesus. And the enemies would always disappear. They'd just, kind of like in a movie or something. Sorry. 
I'm popular, what can I say? Um, so this, what am I talking about? Discernment of spirits. So this is how you're going to do discernment of spirits for your decision is through your prayer time and your examine. What has been happening throughout the day and is anything that's happened today give me peace, courage, clarity, or disturbance in regard to the decision? Now, let's say we do this for three weeks, okay? And then you're like, I'm having a spiritual director appointment and I, in a week, I got to get ready. I actually take a week to get ready for my spiritual director to figure out what patterns are happening in my life because I'm just living my life. So I was like, okay, whoa, what has been happening here? So go back over your journal and read. And go like, wow, whenever I really feel close to the Lord and I feel his love and his goodness, I feel strong. The idea of going on net is just like totally there. Whenever I'm actually discouraged, I've had a really bad day. I couldn't pray. What I can't get out of my mind is like, there's no way I should do net. That's a really bad idea. Okay, this is really important. Because when you have consolation and peace, courage, and clarity about something, it probably means it's God's will. If you have desolation and a movement towards a possibility, that's not the Lord's voice. The enemy is speaking to tell you to do this, which means it's the opposite of what you should do. Now, this is the fun part. If the message you get in your disturbances and your bad thing, the, de the desolation, is the same opposite of this answer, it means it's God's will. So when I'm really feeling the Lord, there's net signs everywhere. It's awesome. It's kind of crazy. Like I really feel excited about it. Net seems to be the answer. When I'm in a really bad space, I feel like there's no way I could do net. I'm wasting my time. Don't go on net. Don't go on net. Go on net equals go on net. Are you following the math, the algebra here that I'm talking about? It's a confirmation. It helps you to see what the enemy doesn't want really bad. He's really trying to disturb you from going from good to better in the service of God. And the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you to go from good to better in the service of God. So they're going to be the opposite um, movements. Now, sometimes that's super clear, and that's when you go to your spiritual director, and you go like, okay, so these are the scriptures, these are the things, these are the patterns, it's consistent, and when I'm really, like, not in a good space, these are the patterns, I just feel like it's, it's obvious, and your spiritual director can go like, that sounds like really solid self-awareness and awareness of what the Holy Spirit is doing, what the enemy is doing, this sounds like a good decision, let's make a tentative decision. But sometimes it's not that clear. You've been doing, it's like a little bit this, a little bit that. Okay, time to buckle down a little harder. So you've done it for three weeks. It's kind of mushy. Father Gallagher would say, let's engage one more time. So now let's get a little bit more intentional about going to specific scriptures in the gospels where Christ is calling his disciples or calling to a greater abandonment, to greater trust. And invest more in those scriptures. Have your prayer time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Do some fasting for this decision. Examine your heart again. Am I actually detached? Was I actually making sure I was detached? No, I was being kind of floppy on it. Okay, I'm going to like really be serious now. I'm going to have a friend hold me accountable. You just have to, you double down and you get a little bit more dirty in it. It's like, no, I'm, I really want to know, Lord. I'm going to fight to hear your word. I do not want to move until I hear your word. And you might then get a clarity. If you still don't have clarity after a week or two of that, then, this is really surprising, then Ignatius says to do the third mode of discernment which is usually our first mode. So it's interesting. By the way, I have to apologize. I forgot something that goes up at the top before you start your modes. In fact, it should be with the, the gravel part, is gathering data. Gathering data. So you to make a decision of like, what do I love better, net 
USA or net Ireland and then praying about it is just kind of silly. It's kind of like a 10 year old answer. Like what candy do I want? No, like what would it take to get to net Ireland? How many people are they accepting? When are the deadlines? What does it cost over here? Okay. Actually they're already filled up. So that's dumb. I don't need to discern it because they've picked everybody. Their scheduling is off. I was, that was, that was dumb. Right? So you need data. Should I do a master's or should I whatever? Well, do you have marks to get into a master's program? Where are they have master's program that are good for you? Apply and see if you can get in. In the meantime, keep discerning, right? So you have to be smart about what you're, like you can't pray in just a, what flavor do I get? Like you need to inform yourself and go like, whoa, both of those are actually really good options. And I see the, how it's going to work. And I still think I need to discern between the two or no net Ireland is out of the question. It actually won't work. So I'm going to discern now net USA and I know all the things. So now I'm going to take that to prayer. So you don't just discern like an, a concept you have to research. Sorry for not saying that at the beginning. Okay. Third mode, third mode is pros and cons, but AMDG style can hashtag that AMDG style. So we would do a pros and cons in a very secular sense of it's awesome. The weather, the pay, the prestige, the people going like all the cool things, right? Like that's how we do pros and cons. No, this is how you are going to do pros and cons. What are the pros only in light of God's greater glory? And what are the cons? So get my master's or um, go on net. The pro for God's greater glory to get a master's, and you list all the pros that you think God might need you to have that master's for his greater glory. Not for like higher pay or letters behind my name, right? But for God's greater glory, why would I need those letters behind my name and this learning? Pray with the Holy Spirit, like, Lord, why might you, and just like totally get into it. Like, yeah, for your greater glory, how could this really serve you? Imagine it, like play with it, brainstorm with it, but only for his greater glory. What would be the cons for God's greater glory if I do my master's? I won't be in ministry as much because I'll be studying more. I'll be away from my community. It could affect my faith. Like you just, you really brainstorm it. Then you do the exact same. It seems redundant, but it's a thing. You do the same thing on the other side. So if I go on net for God's greater glory, how, how is that a pro? And how could it be a con for God's greater glory for me to go on net this year? And it just exercises your brain and allows the Holy Spirit to give insights in a fresh way. It seems like you're repeating it, but you're actually not. And then you take those lists to prayer. And you pray with them and you look at them and you weigh them in your mind and in your spirit. There may be way more on the pro side, but they're all like lightweights. They're actually not that good. But the one pro on the other side is like, bam. You're like, yeah, that's the pro I want. That's so obvious. Okay. I can't pick these pros over that pro. That one pro outweighs all those other ones. Those are those are nice, but this is. Then you have a certain clarity. So another word you could write down would be sufficient clarity. So in third mode discernment or second mode discernment, you could say like, I have sufficient clarity here. Like I'm, I'm settled in this. I, it sounds sound. Like, yeah. I could go to my spiritual director right now and not feel like an idiot saying, what I sense the Lord is saying. Okay. So if you feel like you could explain it to father Raymond D'Souza, not look like an idiot. (laughs) Well, uh, maybe. Okay. Someone else. Uh, (laughs) So you want to be able to like, feel like I, I, I've got this. Not so that you can impress father Raymond D'Souza, but so that when the storms come, you can say, no, I had sufficient clarity. That wasn't a knee-jerk decision. I discerned that well. And my spiritual director said I discerned it well. And I'm going to follow it unless the Lord says differently. 
So then you've made a tentative decision. And in the tentative decision phase, you're giving the Holy Spirit permission to confirm it. Lord, I'm, unless you tell me differently, I really feel like you're saying, get my master's. So I want you to confirm that decision. I want you to give me some signs. I want you to confirm it in my heart. And you continue to do your daily prayer, discernment of spirits, and the examine. And see how the Lord reveals himself through the... Because the Lord is so fun. Like, he will do little signs throughout the day. Like the poster, or the song on the radio, or the YouTube your friend video your friends are watching. Like, it can be just a thing that you're like, that is so for me right now. It's just the little... It's like, I call them little kisses from the Lord. Where she's like, yes, yes, sweetie, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You're good to go. And you bring that also back to your spiritual director. Like I've had these confirmations and they're like, awesome. Go do it. So that in a nutshell is discernment of spirits and discernment of God's will a la St. Ignatius. So I'm going to open up. We've got about seven minutes for questions. That's tricky when there's anxiety in the story. So that is hard. And I think the only like anchor I could give to that other than scripture and Jesus, and the Eucharist, um, actually, okay. I have helped someone who has anxiety and is doing discernment. So what we did for his Ajeri Contra was actually all of those things was praise before you even begin your prayer time. Let's just praise your face off. Put worship on, just enter into God's presence and praise him for his greatness and forget your littleness and just worship him and cast the enemy away. We actually engaged in spiritual battle prayers after that. St. Michael the Archangel, a memorare, invoking his patron saints, um, maybe even quoting like his key scriptures and just kind of like boom, 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 putting guards, guardrails around that prayer time. Um. Maybe there's like some visual things like your Canva <laughs> scripture. Maybe you're a statue of Our Lady. Maybe you have to have your rosary nearby. And then going into the scripture. I'm going to root my prayer in the scripture and I'm not going to be governed by fears. And just trying to put um, his prayer time in a place of confidence in the goodness of God the Father. So that the Lord can speak through peace, courage, and clarity not leading through, I don't know if I'm making the right decision. Ah, when those movements would be happening um, in this direct T, I would say, okay, let's okay, drop the bone, go back. I need you to picture the father. So with this particular direct T, and actually in my own life, is I have images of the father that help me um, imagine myself with God the father. So an icon is like an image of, right? So an image of the father for me is actually, one of them would be Archbishop Prendergast in Ottawa. So he's very close to CCO. So if I'm like, if I went to Archbishop Terry and asked him something, I know he would listen to me and I know he would answer me and I know he would do the thing if I needed it. And so I can imagine myself having a conversation with him and then I'm like, okay, if, if Archbishop Terry is that nice, then the father could be that comfortable. So I put myself in a position in my mind that's similar to an earthly situation. Could be a character on TV. Could be a movie scene. It could be a, an experience from your past. And it just kind of grounds you in safety and refuge and love. Because anxiety wants to rob all of those things. So in the, is it supernaturally induced anxiety or is it physically induced anxiety? I don't know. And they're pretty tricky to figure out. But I think for both, rooting oneself in the security and love of the Father is important. And if you spent your whole prayer time just fighting to feel safe in the Father's arms, he can tell you what he needs to tell you in two seconds. Okay? So you don't have to do the exercises and do the thing right. Yeah. So that you, you get the output. Because he just loves you. And he wants to lead you and draw you into what he's doing in the most loving and awesome way possible. He will challenge you and it will require courage, 
but he will be giving you guardrails and he's Emmanuel God with us. So he's never just saying, get out there and do the stupid thing. Be courageous. He is with us. So he's never, never, never abandoning us. And we should fight even in the courage to be safe, 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 safe with the father and moving with him into the really crazy stuff. That's why I think it's good to know like a time frame helps, right? So if let's say after this rise up, you're like, okay, like I can't get the Jesuits out of my mind. Okay, Lord, I'm going to, I think you're inviting me to discern. I'm going to discern it for a month. I'm just giving you a number to help because we do discern forever. And it's like, I'm going to discern this really seriously for a month. And then if it comes back again, I'll do it again. But I'm going to give this a month. I'm going to give this two weeks. I think a month is a good amount of time because it's usually the barriers between like one spiritual direction appointment to another. So I think that could be good. But before you start discerning, my next question would be like, are you praying with discernment of spirits? Do you understand discernment of spirits? And do you know how to do an examine? So I might coach you to be like, okay, let's get your prayer life strong. Let's recognize lies and how the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I'm going to read some Gallagher stuff. And then in two weeks time or three weeks time, I'm going to start actually really thinking about it. So you've got the tools in your toolkit to do it. Because yes, I do think that's totally like, think about something forever. And it's not discerned. You're in, I don't know, some kind of fuzzy discernment mode. So, I mean, sometimes you have to be that way until the Lord's like, hey, actually discern. But I, I would agree with you. Sometimes we're just overdoing things, but we're actually not doing anything. We're just freaking out about like, maybe I should. So it's called discernment, but it's actually more like, I, I think I should, I can't get it out of my mind. I probably have two minutes or something, right? Okay, in the back. So Ignatius doesn't want you to. He'd rather you pick one thing, but it is possible to do two at the same time. So let's say my example of the masters or the net, doing net. So you know, like, they, I'm going to do one of these two things. You could discern them both at the exact same time because it's either this one or this one. But in general, the, the decision should, the, the question should be a single decision. So should I join the Jesuits? Now that's almost assuming I'm called to the priesthood right? So am I called to the priesthood is actually probably the first question, maybe. Um, not necessarily, because I mean, the priesthood will obviously be included with the Jesuits, unless it's a brother. But um, he would rather you pick one question than saying like, this is what you can't do. What should I do with my life? That's not discernment. You won't get a clear answer that way. Sure, pray that way. What should I do with my life? But ask the Lord, like, show me that what I should be discerning. So you're gathering data for a future discernment by being at that um, book, a mission center. That's why we put it there, not to confuse you, but to give you data of all the different things that, are, that we know are out there. And like, oh, okay, cool. I've got data. This is the one that I thought was really attractive. It kind of resonated with me. So I'm going to discern that. Okay, I'm going to close. Here, I know you probably have like a million questions, but uh, Father Gallagher, discerninghearts.com is, uh, is really good. So I'm going to close with the Sushi Pay prayer, which is um, the favorite, uh, uh, sorry, not the favorite prayer of St. Ignatius, but it's a prayer he wrote himself. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Take, Lord, receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. Everything I have is yours. You've given all to me, to you, Lord, I return it. Everything I have is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. 